I would now request all to join me in welcoming our chief guest, Mr. Satish Pai, Managing Director, Hindalco Industries, to the stage to encourage all members of the non-ferrous metal industry present here with his views and visions about the sector. Sir, we thank you for being here with us today as a chief guest and welcome you to address the gathering and speak about the Indian non-ferrous industry. So good morning and uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, <coughs> the non-ferrous metals. In the uh, last year or so, I have had uh, a lot of opportunity to talk in various forums about aluminium and copper, but I think this is the first time where I will try to take a broader look at the uh, non-ferrous metals industry in India. And I think that uh, taking into account what's happening in the country, I wanted to give a perspective of why uh, non-ferrous metals and the growth uh, of this industry is important to the uh, development of the country. So I think in India, it is very clear for all of us who have seen um, the attention of the government, uh, a lot of the uh, political discourse or the discussions at the business world that the ferrous side, which is uh, iron and steel, normally get a huge amount of attention. And I think that, you know, what we have been trying to do through the various associations, aluminium, copper, uh, all included, is trying to bring on to the public perception that the non-ferrous metal industry is actually not much smaller than the ferrous one. And more important, if you look at the demand and the consumption pattern going forward, as the industry, as the country develops, it's the non-ferrous side that is going to see a much larger rate of growth in the country. So hence, I think that, you know, at least from our side, a huge amount of effort has gone in at the various forums to position aluminium, copper, zinc, and the non-ferrous metals industry overall. Now, if you look at, and you know, we're gonna cover things like copper, aluminium, zinc, nickel, titanium, and if you see uh, the sort of the world market and what part uh, India plays, you will see that, you know, from a percentage point of view, we are still quite small. But I guess, uh, as various speakers have said, that's where some of the opportunities lie. Because India today is the fastest growing market. In fact, if you look at any other place in the world, most places have got a very small single digit growth as far as the consumption goes. And really the only bright spot from a growth point of view, and this is regardless of any metal or industry goes, it is the Indian market now. And I think that uh, the Chinese economy has grown uh, in double digits for many years and is starting to show signs of plateauing. I think that for most of the major producers, and that's why um, the attention that India gets, whether it's aluminium, copper, zinc, shows that you know, most of the people now are actually focusing on the Indian market, which remains one of the bright spots from a growth point of view. Now, the other part that attracts a lot of this attention is that if you look at the bottom half of the curve, on a per capita consumption-wise, India still has got a long way to grow, and hence people think that potential is there. Now, what has really changed in the last two years is the big focus that the government has given on industry and manufacturing expansion. And I think I'm going to show you a couple of things that the government is doing, but I think these are going to actually drive our industry and the consumption of these non-ferrous metals going forward. Now, what makes non-ferrous metals special? And I think that, you know, uh, you may have seen now uh, quite a lot of attention being given to the automotive sector. In Bombay here, uh, you must have seen in the uh, newspapers about the Talgo trains. So in general, because it's, it's difficult to sort of uh, take all these non-ferrous metals under one go, but they tend to be lightweight, they tend to be durable, they tend to be corrosion resistance. You know, the thermal and electrical conductivity tends to be at the similar levels, strength to weight ratio, the recyclability that has been just spoken about, 
All these are what makes non-ferrous metals very special. And this is why if you look at the major sectors, so whether it is transportation, whether it's cars, whether it's trains, whether it's planes, building and construction, the higher you go, most multi-storied buildings now use aluminum facades to get that weight to strength ratio. So across all the major industrial sectors, as India grows, urbanizes, and develops, non-ferrous metals consumption is on a very high growth path. Now also, I guess what we don't realize is that most of the day-to-day -day things that we see around us, whether it's air conditioners, whether it's food packaging, medicals, consumer durables, all these use a very high degree or a high consumption rate of non-ferrous metals. So if the market is good, if the country is doing right, let's see, look at some of the drivers for this growth. So this actually is a little bit messy, but if you look at that red dotted curve, that's how the Chinese aluminum consumption on a per capita grew. And you can see the other more advanced economy going. And if you see just right below in that little few uh, yellow dots there, this is where India is roughly about 2.2 kgs per capita consumption from an aluminum point of view. So it just shows that if the Indian economy grows, if manufacturing as a percentage of GDP, which is less than 15%, goes to the 25 that the government plans envisage, you can see what rate of growth for the non-ferrous aluminum, copper, zinc that you could see compared to what the other countries have gone through in the past. Let's take a little bit of look at all the various government initiatives because these, I think, are actually one of the biggest drivers for our industry. So whether it's the Make in India, whether it's the national capital goods policy, whether it's the smart cities we are talking about, whether it's the push to the whole solar energy, many of these government initiatives are actually going to drive a big amount of consumption of non-ferrous metal. Now, why should India be paying attention to many of these metals? India is very rich in mineral resources. So we have the fifth largest bauxite and coal reserves, the third largest titanium reserve, the sixth largest zinc reserves. And if you actually look at mining as a percentage of GDP, in India it is one of the lowest at around 1% compared to many of the other economies where it is around 3 to 4%. So the government again has, and I think the Secretary Mines will be here later in the day, but they have a very clear policy of trying to get the mining sector and the natural resources sector to be growing in India, and they would like to get by 2025 to at least 1.5% of GDP. Now, there is another very important reason why the mining and the metal side is important to India. Because if you look at the map of India, most of these resources are in the central states. They are in Jharkhand, they're in Odisha, they are in Chhattisgarh, they are in UP, they are in Madhya Pradesh. These are probably some of the most developed, less developed parts of the country. The coastal states in India are developing quite well. But if Indian economy has to grow overall, this heartland states, as I call them, have to have their share of the growth. And this is where most of the natural resources of India lie. By the way, most of the coal resources, power plants are all in these areas, which is why I think that the development of these natural resources, and especially aluminum, copper, things like that, are going to be very in important for the Indian economy so that the growth pattern that we see in the country is equally distributed. We cannot have a state where India will develop only on the coastal side and not have the central parts of India develop. Now, we do have a strong industry presence. And, um, you know, the, the important point which I think uh, Mr. Madia brought out is that, you know, whether it is the upstream, whether it is the downstream, I just took an example of the aluminum side. And you can see that right from the mining side, right down to the consumer side, there is a well-established ecosystem across the country. And I think that, you know, probably what is important and what has not happened in the past 
is that all sectors of this industry, upstream, downstream, mining, I think we have to collaborate among each other. I think it has been seen too long as each of the individual groups operating, each of the individual groups having their own drivers, you know, which is quite natural from a business point of view. But I think if the industry has to develop, and I'll come at it uh, further towards the end, we need to see a lot more collaboration across the whole ecosystem of whether it's aluminium, whether it's co copper, or whether it is zinc. Now, I'll touch briefly on the challenges of the domestic industry in India. I took the example here of copper, but you can see, you can take the same statistics for aluminium, and they will be exactly the same. So with the huge amount of mineral resources in India, whether it's copper or whether it's aluminium, in the last five years, majority of the metal consumed in India is imported. Now, I'm all for free movement, but have you ever heard of Saudi Arabia importing oil? So why should India, with the fifth largest bauxite reserves in the world, be importing more than 50% of its aluminium needs? So there should be, I think, a, a little bit of a balance because if we want the central parts of India to develop, then I think this balance needs to be looked at because the Indian industry, and if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, the domestic capacity, a huge amount of investment has gone in, in this make in India, manufacturing investment has gone in, capacity has been put in. And I think that there should be a little bit of balance between make in India, which actually should be made in India and not just imported into India. Now, what affects the domestic cost competitiveness. And I think that, you know, I have had a lot of discussions with the government side, and I think it is very clear that the Indian government and I think the Indian industry, they are all in a competing on an international market, on an international scale. And hence, this competitiveness and the transparency has to be there. Because I think in general, world trade is growing the days of high tariffs are going to be gone. There is going to be a lot more free movement of people and business across the world. And I think generally that's very good for the world economy. But I think that, you know, there are certain things that we have to look at to create what we would call a level playing field. Now let's go and take, and many of you here will probably relate to many of the points I bring out. Let's look at first land. I mean, since the Land Acquisition Acts have come in, the whole process of buying and getting land for industrial use in India, I think that, you know, I sometimes joke whether we will ever get, for us to put up our new smelters like Aditya and Mahan, we got 3,500 acres. I really doubt that anybody can get the ability to buy 3,500 acres ever again in this country to put up a large-scale manufacturing. So this is certainly one of the things that India will have to look at. Capital, the cost of capital in India compared to any of our competitors, whether it's China, whether it's Middle East, the government is putting a lot of effort, interest rates are coming down, but the cost of capital in India to most domestic uh, industry players is still about 9, 10, or for the lower end, at least 12, 13, 14 percent compared to in Europe, which is probably 1 or 2 percent, LIBOR plus a few hundred basis point, or whether you go to China, where it's about 3 or 4 percent point. The cost of financing does play a big role in industrial competitiveness. So I think land and capital is certainly one place where Indian industry is handicapped. Power, especially for aluminium and some of the other things, power is one of the most important ingredients. I recently showed the minister, the dollars per megawatt hour for Europe, China, Middle East, and India. India is the most expensive power that we have in the world today. And it's a little bit uh, very counterintuitive or paradoxical because we have the fifth largest coal reserves in the world. And hence, why should the cost of power in India be the highest among the most industrial places that we are competing with? So power is one of the most important handicaps uh, 
availability is one point, but actually the cost of power is equally where we are uncompetitive. And let's look at logistics. I always give the famous example that shipping from Jebel Ali to Silwasa port is about 10 to $12 a ton. Whereas if you want to take anything from the center of India to Silvasa, it costs five or six thousand, seventy or eighty dollars a ton. So infrastructure of road, rail and logistics is certainly one of the other big handicaps that Indian industry has. I have to say that all these things is where the government is putting a huge amount of effort and a huge amount of attention. And rightfully so, because if Indian industry, Indian manufacturing has to grow, land, capital, power, uh, logistics, and lot, but not the least, the whole tax scheme. You know, coal in India, if it costs about 1,000 rupees a ton at the pithead to mine, by the time it comes to the consumer, it becomes 2,000, exactly double, because of taxes, cesses. I mean, the, just the green cess in India is now 400 rupees a ton. I don't know if you realize, but India has the highest carbon tax in the world because of all these cesses. So these are some of the items that I think uh, we have been trying to put out to the, most of the government. I think there is a quite a lot of uh, uh, you know, understanding and hence the, you know, we are working very closely with the Ministry of Mines, Ministry of Power, Commerce to try to see how India can actually make the Make in India initiative of the Prime Minister a success. Because to do that, no country in the world has developed without having their manufacturing sector develop. So it's great that IT and services develop. Agriculture will continue to be a big part of the Indian economy. But manufacturing has to grow. And this manufacturing today is stuck at around 13 to 14 percent and has not really been growing. So I think it's very important that many of these challenges are actually acted upon if Indian manufacturing is going to grow. So I'm going to finish with my last slide. What do we think or what help do we need from the government? I think the government needs to help to put the Indian domestic industry on an equal playing field. I, we repeat all the time, we do not want any special help. You know, from a technology point of view, efficiency point of view, you should benchmark us against the best. But at least on the rest, which is the power, the land, the, the capital, financing costs, the compet competition we face should be put on an equal playing field. The government which is doing it has to encourage new investments. I mean, new big investments in manufacturing have to start to happen again. We have to push, as an industry body, increased adoption of non-ferrous metals. Because as the economy grows, I think this is going to be very important. And this collaboration between public and private institutions, whether it's on the R&D side, whether it's on the industry development side, I think these are places where we think the government should focus on. But what should we be doing from an industrial point of view? I think that the investment in R&D and technology innovation is where India is far behind. I often say that let's take aluminum. The Indian aluminum industry started in the 1940s. You know, Renukut and all were, uh, were set up. Indal was here in Hirakud in the 1960s. China started its aluminum industry about 15 years ago. And today, India buys Chinese aluminum technology from the Gami side. So how is it that uh, an industry that has been in India for the last, you know, uh, since the 1960s, 50, 60 years, we have not been able to even do a certain amount of evolutionary technology development. We still go and buy everything every time we set up the next round. And I think that, you know, we can say that government should be doing, but I also think that the industry has to take as much blame or as much, uh, you know, they have their job to do to try to make this R&D and technology uh, innovation happen. I think that the Indian industry today, the most important problem that we see, at least from the Hindalco side, 
is that we have to have a step change in improvement in quality, delivery, and the cost effectiveness of our manufacturing. I think that you know, we have had a, probably a protected market for many years, and hence quality perceptions, I think, are something that we have to change. What China has showed is that they can manufacture it the best quality at the half or less the price that we in India can do. And I think that this is a very important lesson for Indian industry, that we have to up the game of what we consider to be good quality. So I think this quality, then there is this whole conception as I talk to our clients on delivery. It cannot be that, you know, they say that we will send something in one week and we send it in one month. This on-time delivery concept, I think Indian industry has to have a complete step change, especially from a metals and manufacturing side. And of course, we have to become cost effective. And last but not the least, I mean, uh, people do consider sometimes, and I think Sunil also puts Hindalco as a primary company. Hindalco actually is the biggest downstream company for aluminium in, in the country, which is a fact not very much known. But I think the important point that has come out to me in the last six months is that there is a big uh, gap between what we call the primary industry and the downstream. And I think that it's very important if this non-ferrous industry is going to grow that there is active encouragement to grow the downstream industry, first of all. And I think more important as I come down to my last line, for an increased collaboration between the industry players. You know, we have to be able to say that, you know, between upstream, downstream, uh, recycling, we are not going to agree on everything. And that's fine. But there are a lot of things that we will have in common. A lot of things where we will want to work together to develop the industry, to make sure that the consumption grows. And I think this is where, which is why I wanted to participate in a non-ferrous conference like this, because I normally go to an aluminium conference or a copper conference. And even that, there is stuff that is dominated by primary, and then the secondary people have their own. I think, you know, I often joke that the British could rule India because they knew how to divide and conquer. And I think that, you know, what the Indian industry has to learn is that the only way we can survive in a modern, competitive, international world is that if we come together and collaborate as an industry. And, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I wish you a good conference.